Thank you very much. I knew that when we invited Christopher Hitchens to speak, we would draw a large crowd. And I'm sure enough we have. And I am aware, all too painfully aware, that you are here to hear him and not me. So toward that end, let me skip over the elaborate introduction in which Mr. Hitchens' numerous books and essays would be enumerated at length to get to the matter at hand, short and sweet. So, I will not mention Letters to a Young Contrarian, <laughs> <laughs> published in 2001, which might be called a guidebook for the gadfly spirit of Socrates, written for the independently minded person who feels the need to zag when all the world is zigging, and which Hitchens, and which Hitchens wished to call a power of facing, in reference to George Orwell's famous quotation about needing to have the power to face unpleasant facts. And since I'm not bringing that up, I won't mention Hitchens' incisive volume, Why Orwell Matters, from 2002, nor the very recent introduction he's written for the new edition of Animal Farm in 1984. No, not a word of that, since if I were to do that, I might, have to give, I might give you the wrong impression that Hitchens is simply an Orwell scholar, or enthusiast, which he is, but, since the, but then I would also be eager to convey to you a fuller sense of who he is and what he writes about. I would be compelled to mention his other literary essays, on Proust in last month's Atlantic, or John Buchan in, La in the, uh, this month's issue of the same magazine, or the scads upon scads of well-written and thought-provoking reviews in the New York, New York Review of Books, the Times Book Review, and so on and so forth, in the regular column in Vanity Fair, or until recently in The Nation. And then to disabuse you of the notion that he's merely a literary critic working in a journalistic mode, I would have to bring up his book, 2000's No One Left to Lie To, Hitchens' Manifesto Against the Dishonesty and Moral Bankruptcy of the Clintons. I'd probably also have to bring up his sworn statement before the impeachment committee that Clinton advisor Sidney Blumenthal had perjured himself in defending the president, an event which earned him the nickname from a fellow columnist at the nation, Hitch the Snitch. And lest anyone get the idea that it's only Democrats hit Hitchens skewers, I might then feel the need to describe Hitchens' book, The Trial of Henry Kissinger, a compelling book and now documentary in which Hitchens argues that former Secretary of State under Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, is a war criminal whose crimes against humanity deserve to and must be punished according to all international law. And I suppose it would be best not to start down that road, since then you might get the idea that he's just a political writer and I might have to discuss the missionary position, the controversial and indeed scandalous polemic against Mother Teresa, whom he observes, provided a moral fig leaf to brutal tyrants and corporate millionaires by accepting their contributions not for the relief of the poor, but for missionary work advocating anti-abortion and anti-birth control policies, the hardcore positions of the Catholic Church. And I suppose that I, that might get us into a discussion of other fundamentalisms, particularly Islamic, on which topic Hitchens took a strong stance in the weeks following September 11th, writing, quote, the bombers of Manhattan represent fascism with an Islamic face, and there's no point in any euphemism about it. What they abominate about the West, to put it in a phrase, is not what Western liberals don't like and can't defend about their own system, but what they do like about it and must defend. It's emancipated women, it's scientific inquiry, it's separation of religion from state. Loose talk about chickens coming home to roost is the moral equivalent of the hateful garbage emitted by Falwell and Robertson and exhibits about the same intellectual content, end quote. No, I'm not going to get into any of that, thank God. Although I don't think I'm allowed to say thank God. Um, no, instead I'm going to keep it <laughs> short and sweet and ask all of you to join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mr. Christopher, Hitch Mr. Christopher Hitchens, who will be discussing the moral necessity of atheism. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor, for that um, regrettably terse, uh, <laughs> suspiciously uh, abbreviated introduction, um, a resolution I've made really in the course of today is to come to Tennessee more frequently and more doggedly. It's not often in the course of a day that you can spend a morning at the Parthenon and then the <laughs> and then the, the afternoon in the dining room of Hogwarts School, which is where I'm now here to be. If, though, I, from the very forbidding face of the divine that is uh, uh, confronting me at present, I can take what comfort I will from the fact that Hogwarts School at least teaches um, sorcery. Uh, the thing I like about the Parthenon, and always have liked about it, the reason I devoted so much of my time writing a book about it is that 
though it did begin as the temple of a cult of a vanished goddess of Pallas Athena, and it did later become a Roman Christian church, a Byzantine Christian church, after a series of explosions and desecrations uh, involved in both Eastern and uh, Western Christian heresies, and after further explosions and detonations and desecrations, became a mosque, and then for a very brief period in the 1940s was a specially consecrated temple to the National Socialist Nazi New Order in Europe. It had a swastika flag on the pediment of the Parthenon, which was a very degraded form of paganism. Um, it has, after all these vicissitudes, uh, come to the conclusion that I think we all have to come to in the end. It's become a temple of humanism and of the aesthetic and of the view that the proper study of mankind is man. And it's nice that in Nashville you can see it with the sculpture on the pediment, especially the horses of Cellini as seen from underneath, which thanks to the colonial depredations of the British Museum, you can't see in Athens itself. So be, be grateful for what you've got. In fact, I, as an immigrant to this country, part of, part of the underlay of what I want to say to you this afternoon is um, be aware of how fortunate you are to live in a country that has a Bill of Rights and a constitution and a rule of law. Never dream of taking this for granted. Never forget how long it took to accomplish. Uh, cherish it as, as best you can. Even I, who come from a country which doesn't have a constitution, but instead has a state church uh, headed by a woman who can't really preach in this church, um, who's also the head of the armed forces, as well as the state, and whose son, Prince Charles, is about to, we learn, possibly convert to Islam. Um, this is what you get for trying to found a constitution on the family values of Henry VIII. Um, be, be appreciative, in other words, of what you've got. Now, the, the title that I chose, um, or that we agreed upon, um, is obviously, fairly obviously to some of you, uh, stolen, annexed, plagiarized from... Uh, the essay that got uh, Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley, that is, um, thrown out of Oxford University. He wrote a short, rather beautiful essay called The Necessity of Atheism. And at that point, you couldn't attend any university in England, certainly not Oxford, unless you professed a certain kind of Anglican Christian orthodoxy. Those days actually are not very remote from us. It's not at all long since uh, these religious tests and... Um, um, Censorships were, were commonplace, even in the academy. Um, but what I want to appeal to when I mention Shelley is the tradition of, um, and also to attack, to, to reproach to some extent, is a well-known tradition of nostalgia among ex-believers. I think probably the largest community in the world at the moment of former members of different churches, former or lapsed members. And it's very common to hear them say that though they had no choice but to abandon their faith and find their reason, that they feel the loss like a missing limb, like an absence um, of something fundamental. I suppose my first task, therefore, is to say to any such people who are here today, cheer up. The best um, such book that I know about was written by Michael Harrington, who some of you may remember. Uh, he was the author of The Other America, a wonderful study of poverty in this country that is credited with starting President Kennedy's uh, War on Poverty, President, uh, President Johnson's, uh, I mean, say War on Poverty, but read by President Kennedy. Um, he was a, a, a deeply devout uh, ex-Catholic. He wrote a book called The Politics at God's Funeral, a reference that won't escape you where he offered a sort of mourning for the departed. Agnosticism says, in a way, that the loss of God is a, is a loss of, of comfort, of consolation. The, agnostic, the agnosticism of many people maintains that belief, however, is optional at best. It may be unsupported by any facts, but it may not necessarily be inconsistent with them. And many, many humanists can be found to this day to say, that they wish it were otherwise. In other words, that they wish it were true, uh, they wish the foundations of faith could be found in reason or in evidence, 
They regret the fact that it cannot, and they rest their case there. This is not just a paradox for people like Michael Harrington, who were, who were in their day the backbone of the secular socialist American left. It's a paradox, too, very little pointed out, I think, for American conservatism, especially in its modern form.